just says the music comes out of a can. All right, better be more than that. Just says the music comes out of a tape recorder. You can still have good church, amen. amen. And when you just work with it, the best way you know how, and, amen. and uh, here. the Lord is here, amen. amen. He is here, hallelujah, he is here, amen. amen. If you have your Bibles this evening, this afternoon, and you open them to Revelation, the 21st chapter, We're going to begin at verse 1. This is a very exciting portion of Scripture, actually. You might not think so at first glance, but believe it or not, it is. Because there's one reference here in the first eight verses. There's one specific reference that I would like to address and speak to you today for a moment and that is relative to the tabernacle of God so the title of my message today would be the tabernacle of God Revelation 21 verses 1 through 8 King James reads as we stand in honor of the reading of God's word and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, up prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he, notice it doesn't say they, he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away and he that sat upon the throne said Behold, I make all things new. Now who's been talking, who they been talking about so far in this? God. We hear God, God, God. God spoke from heaven. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the first of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I, Itango Bishikamayim, I will be his God and he shall be my son. That's Jesus speaking from the throne. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. Hallelujah. But the fearful and unbelieving. And I believe here is an example of where the word Kai has been missed. Translated, but the fearful and unbelieving, even the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I hope by the time we meet here this afternoon, we're going to have a brand new take and a brand new understanding of the tabernacle of God. Amen. I think you're going to enjoy this. Amen. So, would you bow your heads with me? Master, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful, precious portion of Scripture that is indeed a glimpse into eternity. And, Master, today as we uh, delve into the word of God, we ask that you're anointing the flow, Lord, in a mighty, wonderful way. Touch each heart of every hearer. Those in this building, those that will hear my take, those that one day may hear on the internet. 
Let the revelation of our God flow this hour. Open the eyes of those that are blind. Open the eyes, God, of those who have been blinded by tradition, those who have been blinded, Lord, by false teaching. Allow them to be loose this hour by the wonderful presence and power of the Holy Ghost upon your word. Grant it, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. We, we read about the tabernacle and you know uh, it's funny because when you look at the Old Testament and you read how God gave very specific directions to the children of Israel in the wilderness as to how they were to construct the tabernacle. Now, Trinitarian preachers, many theologians from many different realms of thought will all tell you the same thing, and that is that the tabernacle is a type of Christ. It represents in every single detail the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. It represents uh, the Lord in a wonderful way. Now, I do teach on the tabernacle and all of the uh, representation and how uh, it represents the Lord and all of that. And it's wonderful. It's a story. But I'm, I'm going to go past that today. We're going to go to something that I think is even more exciting and more important to understand than even uh, just the representation found in the tabernacle. In what we have read tonight in our primary text, the exciting proclamation is made from heaven. The tabernacle of God is with men. Hallelujah. And a lot of people read this and they understand this to mean that a structure or a building is with humankind or with mankind and therefore God's presence is with them as well. But I'm here to tell you today that in this proclamation, that is not at all what is being said, not even close. What is in reality being said is that God has taken upon himself flesh. It's what we call this earthly tabernacle, hallelujah, and that he has worked among men, hallelujah, in an earthly tabernacle, and the tabernacle of God, hallelujah, is with man, glory to God. The tabernacle of God came down 2,000 years ago. He took upon himself an earthly tent, hallelujah, a tent of flesh and blood, glory to God, and he dwelt among us so that he could be what? Our God. And so that we could be his sons. Amen. You see, the tabernacle, I'm bound to get excited here. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying real hard to stay composed so I can get it out. The tabernacle was designed, Tommy, <coughs> first of all, to be temporary. <laughs> oh, you see, there is a heavenly temple. Amen that was akin to the earthly temple. But once the temple was built at Jerusalem, the tabernacle no longer had a purpose. Amen. Because the tabernacle was a tent structure that only served as a mobile temple until the people of God got to where they were going, the promised land. Once they got to the promised land, they built the temple and the tabernacle was no longer necessary because everything in the tabernacle went in the temple. Hallelujah. Everything that had been designed for the tabernacle was then placed in the temple. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. I see the Old Testament prophet <laughs> In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne, his one throne, and he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the tabernacle. No! His train filled the temple. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Woo! 
Yeah. Take a wild guess at how many, how many compartments composed the tabernacle. Exactly. The outer court, the outer part was covered with skins of animals. Covered with skin, flesh. In God it's this humanity. Then you had the holy place where you entered in and this was no longer a place that was covered by animals. This was a place for all kinds of precious wood and metal and precious stones and pearls were used. And it was only accessible to a very few. But once you went through the holy place, there was another element. Glory. It was called the Holy of Holies. Glory to God, children. I'm just going to tell it to you this way because I can't drag it out and make it more dramatic. I just can't do it today. Body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. Jesus Christ had a body, but the soul was that of the Father. He said, Get up, my kid. You see me. You see my power. Glory to God. I don't have a human soul apart from God. I have the nature and the soul of God himself in me. Glory to God. And on top of that, if you go a little deeper, there's a place in me called the Holy, the Holy, one of every person, but God's power and His divine Holy Ghost resides. Glory to God. Woo, glory. Ain't that exciting? <laughs> well, Brother Mario, your theory sounds good, but I'm not sure I buy it. Well, Let's just tell you some things. Second Corinthians 5, 1 through 4 declares, Paul is writing, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, it's only temporary. It's not meant to be eternal. This body is a tabernacle. He said, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dis dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now is Paul talking here about a mansion just over the hilltop? No. He's talking about that heavenly body. We have a spiritual body, he said, which is not made with hands. And then listen, he said, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Yes, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found in him. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. In other words, he said, we're not, we're not wanting to put off this natural existence alone. He said, but to be clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. He said, we're not begging God to put this life aside. We're begging God to give us our other life. Yes, amen. We're not asking God to simply lay aside this body. No, we want our new one. Amen. Amen. Who wants you to put this one aside? Yeah, all right. You need something. So he said, you know, we're not we're not desiring in the deepest part of our heart to simply put off this existence. He said, but we're desiring to put on yes. that one. Amen. But do you hear his reference yes. to this human form? What does he call it? Tabernacle. This tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Because this tabernacle is temporary. This tabernacle was never meant to be permanent. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. My Lord have mercy. Now listen. Second Peter 1, 12 through 15. This is the Apostle Peter writing. Not Paul. Different writer. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth, 
Yea, I think it neat. As long as I am in this tabernacle. Now he wasn't talking about a building. To serve you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me, moreover I will endeavor that ye be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. So now we bring Paul speaking of our human form as a tabernacle. We have Peter speaking of our human form as a tabernacle. You see how I'm going to figure out which direction I'm going to go this. <laughs> there we go. Let me read to you from Acts chapter 7, verses 44 through 50. The apostle is speaking and he said, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find the tabernacle for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house. How be it? The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not mine hand made all these things? God says to Solomon and to David, y'all want to build me a house? He said, how are you going to build me a house? How can you build a house that can contain me? It's and how be it our God does not dwell in a house made with hands. Amen. But he dwelled in a tabernacle that he prepared for himself. Not made by human hand. Not having any part in it of a human being in the terms of the creation of that child Jesus that was in Mary's womb. But our God done well in a house made by human hands. Oh, but let's look at the book of Revelation again. Chapter 13, verses 4 through 9. Let's read a little bit about this character who's called the Antichrist. And the word of God said, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. Listen to this now. To blaspheme his name. Whose name? God's name. And... His tabernacle. The Antichrist is going to bless God, His name, and His tabernacle. How do you bless the tabernacle of God? He's going to speak against the man we call Jesus. He's going to bless the man that we call Jesus. And that is blaspheming the tabernacle of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? He's going to blaspheme the name of God. Well, how is he going to blaspheme the name of God? Well, those of us that have the revelation understand the name of God is Jesus. Jehovah's Savior. We understand that. Therefore, he's going to blaspheme the name of Jesus. He is going to blaspheme the man Jesus, the tabernacle. Because that man, that flesh, 
was the tabernacle of the Most High, prepared by his own hands, that he might dwell therein, and no man had any part. Oh, hallelujah, listen to this now. To bless see God, to bless see his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwelt upon the earth shall worship him. Listen to this next phrase. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. whose names are not written in the, life, in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. What does that say? That says everybody's going to worship him except one little group. That's folks whose names are in the book. <laughs> he said if their name's in the book, they all worship him. He said, and from the beginning of time, their names said in that book, God knew before they ever got saved that they be saved. And their names said in that book. And he said, all the earth, all the peoples of the earth are going to actually worship the Antichrist, except for those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Hallelujah. Of course, it would be nice if we didn't have to be here to see that, although I got news for you. I got a feeling a lot of us are going to be. I don't say that because I think that uh, folks are going to miss the rapture. I believe the rapture isn't going to happen until the Antichrist is well established in the earth. I know there's a lot of thoughts on that. Well, that's all well and good. I believe strongly that according to this, the Antichrist will have power for three and a half years. We've been given to him for three and a half years. And uh, according to my understanding of the Word of God, the tribulation period will last seven years. The first three and a half years will be the purging of God's church. Judgment in the church. Judgment must first begin at the house of God. God can't come and take his people home without first separating the sheep from the goats. Come on now. Judgment has to take place first before the Lord can come to take his church out of here. The first three and a half years are going to be a period of great uh, persecution against God's church. What did I just read to you about this three and a half years of the Antichrist? It says he is given power to come against the saints and to come against the church and to overcome them. That's the judgment. But my Bible tells me when that Antichrist gets up in God's holy temple in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, and he stands in that place I just spoke to you about, called the Holy of Holies, which is representative of the very presence and power of God himself. He stands in that location and declares, I am God. <laughs> Jesus said, if you're on top of the house, don't even think about going to grab your coat. You don't have time. <laughs> he said, the Sunday, the trumpet will start to sound. At that very moment that the Antichrist has the goal to step into God's holy of holies and declare himself to be God, this is the abomination of desolation that the prophet Daniel spoke of. He said, when that happens, he said, honey, just look up your redemption, not his drawing nigh. No, he said, your redemption is at hand. Hallelujah. It's going to happen simultaneously at that very moment. God's going to take just my church up out of there because all hell is about to break loose. I'm about to unleash a judgment on this world that they've never seen before in all of eternity, in all of time. And God will not judge the righteous with the wicked. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. So the church has got to be pulled up out of here fast. Because God's reaction will be swift and his judgment will be certain. Amen. According to Smith's Bible dictionary, the tabernacle is defined as the tabernacle was the tent of Jehovah, called by the same name as the tents of the people in the midst of which it stood. It was also called the sanctuary. 
and the tabernacle of the congregation. The very first ordinances given to Moses after the proclamation of the outline of the law from Sinai related to the ordering of the tabernacle, its furniture, and its service. In other words, when God began to give the people of Israel the law, first business that God had was, y'all build this tabernacle. It's only going to serve you temporarily. Well, I got news for you. In our primary text today, we were reading about the day that the bride and the bridegroom are united together. But you see, when the bride and the bridegroom are united together, that tabernacle will still be there. That physical message of the Lord Jesus Christ will still be there. But the tabernacle is only temporary. Once you get the temple, you don't need the tabernacle. Once you get a house, you don't need a tent. <laughs> Once you got a place, baby, you don't need the travel trailer. You hear what I'm telling you? And the Bible said, I beheld the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Guess what's in the midst of the new Jerusalem? God's temple. The one that God built himself. And that's why he said, <laughs> that's why he said, and I will be their God. And they shall be my sons. Hallelujah. Because this earthly tabernacle that his church and his people need in order to see and identify him and in order to relate to him, suddenly that earthly tabernacle is going to break loose. And the brightness of his glory, hallelujah, is going to shine forth like the sun. And he is going to ascend the stairs to his throne. And he is going to sit upon that throne as God. And no longer will we ever see the tabernacle. Because the tabernacle is no longer necessary as God sits in the midst of his holy temple. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? People say, why does the Bible say that? Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father, at the right hand of the throne of God. I mean, it's easy. Just that I'm not driving my car, don't mean I gotta park it somewhere. You gotta park it, you gotta put it somewhere. And you only use it when you're using it. That doesn't mean it disappears when you're not driving it. Amen. And right now, that body, that visage, that persona of of uh, Jesus Christ is literally sitting at the right hand of the throne of God for what reason? Because he ain't ready to get up in the throne and be God yet. Redemption is not yet complete. The people of God haven't been gathered up yet. Oh yeah, he's made arrangements to purchase us, but he has not yet gotten his purchase possession. He said, if I go away, I will prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. But he has not yet come to gather up his pride, and therefore, children, he is waiting. That physical message is waiting beside the throne of God, not in the throne of God, not on the throne of God, beside the throne of God. God is not going to sit in his throne as a man. Amen. Amen. But when it's all done, and it's all finished, that's a different story, because then the tabernacle is going to give way. And the scripture says, then we shall see him as he is. <laughs> oh, I just see everybody in heaven being handed out sunglasses. Yeah, 600 SPS. <laughs> Now don't look directly into his face. <laughs> It'll blind you, but you know what it won't? Because we'll be in a new tabernacle. Hallelujah. We'll be in a new existence. We will have put off this earthly tabernacle and put on a, a an existence that is similar to his own. 
and spiritual in nature. And all of a sudden, like Adam and Eve in the garden, as God would come down, the Bible said, and walk with them in the cool of the day, all of a sudden, would they ever look upon God in the same way that Adam and Eve used to be able to do so before the fall? Isn't that exciting? Lord have mercy. I know I'm trying to get you out of here real quick. That's what I know. Tommy said, Tommy said, no, I'm pretty much done, I think. <laughs> Folks, I'm here to tell you today, we, we read in our primary text tonight that the tabernacle of God is with men. What are we talking about? The building. I was talking about the tent of Jehovah. That tent, that structure, that temporary structure that God used in order to contain his presence. Three parts. Body, soul, spirit. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Uh, spirit, soul, body. It's not three people you've been with. I'll say it one last time. If I, if I stood up here and I had the ability, the Bible says the Word of God can do it. I can't, but the divine soul and spirit. If I could take my soul and send it over here, put my spirit over here, there'd still be one of me standing up here. Amen. And any one of those elements would be one third of the whole. Amen. I don't care how you slice it. Well, the truth of the matter is, God is by no means three people. God is body, soul, and spirit in the person of the man Jesus Christ. And just as we human beings are body, soul, and spirit. Amen. That means three elements of one person has nothing to do with uh, all these different people. And the external, the body part, is what we call the tabernacle. The tabernacle of God today is with men. And he will dwell with men, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God, boy, talk about redundancy. For the word of God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the word I guess I was saying that make it then. There'll be no more pain. I'm teasing. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There'll be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And that will include our earthly tabernacle. And that will also include his earthly tabernacle. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful, it is done. Alright, it's similar but different. Remember on the cross, Jesus declared, it is finished. Yes. I've had to explain this to a lot of people in my day. If you think when the Lord said it is finished, that it was done, you're wrong. You're wrong. No, it was finished. He had finished what he came to do. There was not one chore left undone. There was not one prophecy left unfilled. There was not one word of God's sacred script that had not been realized right down to the last letter. And he said, it's finished. Paul said he gave up the ghost. He was finished for that leg of his journey. But he wasn't done. <laughs> he wasn't done. But in Revelation tonight, we read that he declares in his job. Hallelujah. When you call oh, glory to God, when you hear the words, it is done. <laughs> that means it's time for me to put off this tabernacle. It's time for me to quit being their big brother, start being their gay. Hallelujah. 
just take that tabernacle and break it off and set it aside. And we now can look at him and look upon him as he is, not as he was. You hear me? As he is, not as he was. Thank God, amen. Would you stand with me tonight? Did you get a little bit encouraged by that? <laughs> amen. Amen. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you, God, for your wonderful word. We thank you, Lord, for this encouraging understanding of your wonderful, wonderful word. The day is coming, Lord, that all pain and sorrow, all weeping, Lord, all sickness, all disease are going to be left aside. And we shall never again have to deal with these things because we're going to be in a new world. We're going to be in a new place. We're going to be in a brand new, wonderful creation from heaven brought down the planet Earth. And Master, today we're just so grateful that we understand the truth concerning your tabernacle. We're grateful, God, that Jesus Christ, the man, was and is even today the tabernacle of God. And Lord, we're just so grateful that you are willing to robe yourself and take upon yourself that precious role and that precious uh, position so that you might do for us what we were unable to do for ourselves. The with us today, God bless this day, give everyone the strength to do what they need to do and help us to be back the next time, uh, appointed time, we ask it in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. God bless you this afternoon. Amen. What? New message. Uh, yeah. Y'all, wait a while.